Welcome to the Fin Maniacs FinCast. And if you're already looking in, if you're not tuning in audio, he's just doing the visual. You obviously know we have Greg Camarillo, legend, Miami Dolphin receiver. How you doing, Greg? Welcome to the show. Um, I'm doing well, man. Thank you for having me. How's everything going out west? Uh, how you handling things during these times? I hope everything is uh, happy and healthy as they can be right now. Yeah, uh, as as they can be is the operative right there. You know, the family's healthy. I've got three little girls that are seven, five, and two, and everything's all good. It's just, you know, five people cooped up in a house all day, and uh, it's an adventure, that's for sure. You know, I was going to complain a little bit because I got an eight and a four, two boys. I'm not going to go that route. Yeah, he does it right right there. But uh, I hope that you guys are enjoying yourselves and obviously staying well. So uh, being that you got those kids probably in bed, mine are in bed, Let's do this, man. Let's keep this in kind of a, a nice uh, two-quarter football mindset. So the first thing I obviously want to kind of touch on is bring me through that whole 2007 season. Obviously, Dolphin fans, if you got to go back into your time machine, it wasn't, it wasn't a fun time. But lo and behold, there was one game. And it's almost unbelievable because they brought the 72 team out that game. And every time they do that, there's magic in the air. Yeah. And now I'm just going to let you talk about that day. Okay, well, it had been a long journey for me personally and a long season for the entire team. Uh, I had started the year in San Diego, so I, this was going in my third NFL year. I uh, spent all of training camp in San Diego, was cut at the last cut. Um, but fortunately, I had a good relationship with Camp Cameron, so I was able to uh, come to Miami because of him. Uh, started at the bottom of the depth chart at wide receiver, the sixth or seventh, however many receivers we had, I was the last one. Uh, got a little action on special teams, and people started getting hurt. Uh, they traded Chris Chambers. Uh, next thing you know, I'm the fourth guy on the depth chart, and we go into this Ravens game, and um, they call four wide receivers. And I, and I go running out there, and I get my first, I think, two catches of the game during, during – um, the first four quarters, and this is literally like catch two and three of my career. So going into this game, I, I literally had two yards for a career, like this one catch for two yards. Um, and then, you know, they it was the play works for the first two times, and we get into overtime, and sure enough, they call four wide receivers again. I go trotting in, and there's literally only one play we're running out of that. So, it was, and, you know, fortunately, the defense. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We got a little skippy, but go ahead, man. Uh, the DB didn't know what was coming, and he was tired. And Cleo Lemon put the ball right in the money, and and Ed Reed, who one of the ever play, and the ball was coming in, just away from picking it off. But luckily, Cleo right on the money, and you know I've never been the fastest guy. I ran. Like I, my life depended on it, and and there we were celebrating with the true faithful fans, only the ones that could stick around through 0 and 13. The true faithful fans rode with us into that end zone, and it was it was the moment of glee during a tumultuous season. Yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. Now, when we first started communicating way back when, do you remember I told you a little snippet of a story where I was? Your game was the definition of a where were you when kind of game, you know? And obviously, look, we all knew going into that Week 15 game, the season's obviously over. And us as Dolphins fans, you mentioned the faithful fans. You know, I was on a cruise ship with my wife, my then fiance, right? And I'll keep this short. I'll try it because it's a big story. But the cruise ship was about to leave. The only reason I was on that ship is because we were not that great that year. But I tried to get myself in front of a TV. Watching the game. The game went into overtime. Got a knock on the door. I'm on a cruise ship. We had to go to that mandatory whatever, the life vest class. I refused to leave. I said, like, my guys are in overtime. I'm not waiting another year. We're going to win this game. And then literally the second I closed the door, I didn't see the pets. I all of a sudden heard cat, and then I went to the TV, and then you went. And then I saw, I almost thought Ted Ginn was going to make a block. And you guys just, the whole team fell foul with you. And then you just tell me through that moment. Uh, I mean, it's um, you know, it, it all it all just happened so quickly. When we went from pathetic 
football team ever to slightly less pathetic. And it was just, I mean, there have been it's so many heartbreakers in that season because it wasn't as though we were getting blown out. These weren't like 30-point losses, 45-point losses. We were losing close games, three-point games, six-point games, and just heartbreaking. You know, every week in the NFL, you put – your heart and soul into learning the plays, practicing on Monday. You really believe you're going out there to win. So to go through 13 of no luck, um, it was heartbreaking. But, you know, the credit to the guys on that team, and we just stuck together and fine. And that, and it shows at the moment we get in the end zone. It was literally just everyone was happy. Everyone was excited. Uh, and it was, it was a fun moment, man. And we got to kind of, Scrum up against the wall, and the you know, fans were throwing beer in the air. It was just, uh, I, I've never won a championship, but it certainly felt like we won something that day. I'm with you 100%. It, I think the Dolphins, I mean, we use the term undefeated because they, they were the only team. The importance of that one, I mean, you guys were 1 and 15, but the importance of that one to not have a zero, to me, as a New York guy, where I always had, yeah, I got Moreno, I got the undefeated season, you guys are Jet fans, leave me alone. You know, that was what I had. That would have almost been negated. Not negated, but to have a team do both extremes, there's it almost ironically brings to that ironic medium of 8-8 eight eight that the Dolphins kind of have been the last two decades. It's just a weird time. And you had one of those moments that gave Dolphin fans what we have. We have a lot of moments, you know, and I think that do you, do you call it a game. Do you call it like the this or the that? You know, there's the hook and lateral. There's the miracle. There's the as recent the Mountaineer shot. What do you call your game? Uh, you know what? I don't even I don't have a name for it. It's no just one uh, the one in the one in fifteen years, kind of what we talk 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 about. Uh, Can I give um, it a shot? It hasn't. Uh, Jason, it drop one on there. We'll take it. I'm a little shocked that it's, you know, what are we talking, like 14 years or something? No one's come up with it? You guys yeah. didn't have a walk-off win. You had a runoff win. The runoff. How about it? I know it's a bad football term, but you guys ran off and you won. It was amazing. I'm, I'm cool with that. We can roll with that one. Let's do that. And let's roll into really what was probably one of the greatest two-year situations Going from that extreme one fifteen, and then you guys won a division. You won a division with yeah. probably one of the more innovative situations in football. And there's a lot of rumors about that. We'll talk about the Wildcat, but I want to really kind of know what happened from the time that you made that catch. You ran off with your teammates, and I think that that kind of jump started a lot. You had a heck of a season. The following that year, I know it was kind of cut a little short. When you go to week twelve, you'll talk a little bit about that. But that was a magical year, and you were you were balling, man. So, what was the difference? What was that magic thing? Yeah, yeah, um, that's that's very, 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 but it was so. Uh, uh, the team was sold. Um, oh, everyone changed. Like, like the, every coach changed. Um, you know. Parcells came in and just totally just deleted everything and started totally fresh. And in the first meeting, first team meeting, calls everyone in and slaps this gigantic binder down on the table. He's like, this is our injury report from last season. And it was like, it looked like an encyclopedia a dictionary, like a yellow pages kind of book. And he's like, you cannot win games when everybody is hurt like this. Uh, and that was the start of how things changed. And it, and it wasn't so much like you're just not going to get hurt. as is your mindset is you are going to play through everything unless your leg is falling off. And, um, you know, with with Coach Sperano in there, they made us work. And I mean, probably the hardest I've ever worked in my life. And then also with that, incorporate was the feat uh, of your job will be gone if you don't perform. And it is it is stressful. See all these gray hairs in the beard I'm growing right here. Those are because of times like that. Um, so they make sure if you're slacking, you're going to get cut. And literally every week, someone was cut because they were slacking. So it was super stressful, but it motivated guys to get going, particularly guys who have already made a lot of money or first round picks or need a little kick in the rear, a little a little reality check. Um, 
And so they worked us hard. Like it would go in to practice literally and survive. No, that's not a good mindset for an athlete, but it was practices were so hard. It was, all right, I got to get my rhyme, mind right so I can get through this practice. Uh, and that shaped the mentality of the team. We were going to be grinders. We were going to be guys that fought hard. There was nothing that was going to stop us. Um, and that's the only way you can take a team from 1-15 in into the playoffs. Uh, it would be the deepest turnaround in NFL history to go from one game to 11. And that's something I'm because that's not a personal accomplishment. That 53 guys coming together, busting their ass, and changing a culture. Absolutely right. And it didn't start easy. I mean, and I know the Wildcat, or at least you just correct me if I'm wrong. I think you guys started 0-2. You know, Chad Pennington coming. I'm rocking my Chad. I know it's weird. I'm a New Yorker. I got Chad Pennington. The second day got him. That was my first troll. That was my first troll job. But I rocked the Chad Pennington. And when did the Wildcat call? I heard a rumor it was on a flight. with what Was it Was it David Lee, assistant coach, or what happened? That happened. Yeah, yeah, he came, he came from Arkansas where they did that. Uh, I think with Darren McFadden. I, I gotta have to check that. But I think that's what it was. Yeah, so we were we were zero two. We were zero and two, and we had, a lot of us had been through that previous season, and we did do something drastic. So uh, going up to New England, I think this was week three. Um, yep, and we needed. To thinking this is going to be a, a total embarrassing disaster or it's going to be amazing. And I don't think anyone knew what happened. And ran it the first time, and we're all excited. We knew it. You know, you know the personnel that comes in when they're running it. And so I'm on the sideline just watching it, and it worked perfectly. And, and it was, there's nothing greater than seeing Bill Belichick on the other sideline just losing his mind because he can't figure out how to stop it. This is a guy who prides himself on preparation. And here he was stuck with Netzer to the Wildcat. It was glorious. It was amazing. And I had, this was the first year that I was living, not in college or not in a situation where I was able to say to my, you know, now my wife, we're putting a dish on the roof. I'm getting my, I'm not going to a bar. I need my games. So I was, yeah, Lord, this, is, this coincided with everything. 2008, my wedding year, had direct TV, love and life. My brother, my five year younger brother, does nothing like me. He's a Dolphin fan. The one thing he's taken, he calls me and he says, "What are you? What are you watching? Are you see this? Are you see this?" I'm like, I, "I don't know where we are right now. I think we're in the twilight zone." The second we're on the call, another touchdown, another touchdown. We're on the phone the whole game, and then Ronnie threw one. I mean, that was like ridiculous. Yeah. What was the and, right And that's just, oh, it was fun, man, to go to New England and win. But it, it just, to speak about that, about Ronnie throwing a touchdown, it's not as the, this is this magic formula where when you run this play with whoever you're running, it works. It's because those guys, Brown's athleticism, run to be able to throw, but then his intelligence of knowing when to pull the ball and which one. Uh, the audibles that needed to be run. Ricky Williams out there. Patrick Cobbs was another secret weapon. It, 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 and then the offensive line. It, it's not like let's just drop this miracle play. We have some guys on that team that could pull off a play like that. 100%. Absolutely. I mean, I think everything just showed how much preparation beats lack of knowing what's coming. And the league tried to copycat. I mean, now it's kind of extinct unless you have the exact right personnel. And I remember watching like Highlights, because that game was a game you watch over and over and over. Ronnie was throwing a lot. He was warming up. He was throwing a lot, and I yeah. remember like, okay, he's a left. This is this is this is cool, and it was brilliant. And I remember that whole season leading into the dream matchup, week seventeen, and I used to love Brett Favre, and I had to watch him mm -hmm. and Taylor on the other side. And that was rough. Yep. I know that you mentioned about when Parcells came in. If Jason Taylor was expendable, I can't, I can't imagine what was going through everybody's head to training camp or any every moment that you were putting tape on. They, I, yeah, I mean, that was it. But no one that was safe. If you were inconsistent, if you were messing up, if you were not handling business, you were gone. And it was it was literally that simple. 
And that's football. I mean, it, it could change on a dime. And we saw, you know, last year to kind of get to current, the Niners were, uh, you know, they had, obviously had an injury in a quarterback situation two seasons ago with Garoppolo. But they get a draft pick in a Bosa. They turn everything around. Shanahan puts together this run scheme. Lo and behold, this, this amazing run situation with blocking and fullbacks. And, and it's almost like a new version. It ain't the Wildcat, but it shows what could happen. Do you follow Dolphin football now? I know you had some other couple of colors that you wore. What's your favorite? Yeah. You could be you nice. know, and it's, it's a tough call. So I live in San Diego. Uh, I had originally played for the Chargers. I was After you're done playing, it's hard to be a fan of a team, particularly in my situation, because I was either cut or traded from each team. So it's not as though I'm like, oh, man, I love that experience. <laughs> but um, – I was I was leaving that behind. I was becoming a Charger fan again, and then they abandoned us. So there goes that fandom. Uh, I try to follow the Dolphins as my father, but I don't have Sunday ticket. I don't watch every every Dolphins game. Um, so I, I just watch football. It's not I don't really have a, a true team that I go nuts for. I don't I don't really play for football. And, This sort of, I think we're all good now, but fantasy football is great, and that's what a lot of people kind of look at when you look at stats. And now that brings me to the draft offense, offense, offense. Everyone loves the wide receivers, which is great. There's a lot of wide receivers in this class. Are you a draft guy? Are you gonna be watching the draft? I mean, that's kind of the only thing we have now as sports fans. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I'll watch it. I'm not, I'm not a huge draft guy, I'm not going to spend any time studying what people need where they're going to fall, uh, you know, the different trades and all that. But uh, I will definitely watch it because I literally have no sports. So that'll be the most exciting thing for, for the entire month of April. But, um, you know, it, it's the sexy picks don't all turn out to be sexy. I saw a tweet the other day that was every first-round wide receiver taken after 2015 or something like that. And it was a list of guys that were not very impressive wide receivers. So you look at these first round picks, it don't necessarily work out the way you want them to. But then you look at the 49ers who spent, I want to say, the last five years picking defensive linemen and one offensive lineman and how well that's worked out for them. So on draft day, they're picking dudes you probably never even heard of. But over time, and the Cowboys did the same thing. You invest in that offensive and defensive line, and that's what it pays dividends. I agree, and I feel like that is a little bit of a, a tune of a Bill Parcells. You, you, you build the lines and everything else kind of takes care of itself. And I, I'm, a, I'm an offensive line guy, I'm a wide receiver guy, and I'm a cornerback guy. Those are like, obviously, quarterback is a Dolphin fan, but I really kind of scrutinize those positions heavy. And the wide receiver position in Miami really was a very prideful position. I mean, you mentioned Chris Chambers was traded, but he's a top five, six reception guy in Miami history. The Marx Brothers, obviously, everything like that. So do you feel like you're kind of part of like a position group for a team that really has some terrific names and you have that that runoff win and you had a terrific... That, that play, I think, catapulted you to have a very nice couple of seasons for the Miami Dolphins in a transitional period and you haven't had that game. What was it? Denver? You went off against Denver in uh, 2008. That was a good game. Yeah, and that was a big color game. That was my career high of, of 11 catches. So it's, I mean, it, it it goes to speak about what you're talking about. You build a team from uh, from the linemen out. Uh, so you look at our receiving core. The year we went to the playoffs, it was Ed Ginn, who was a first round pick. Uh, it was still playing football, which is amazing. Love that guy. Me and Devon Best, so two other undrafted free agents. Uh, and it's a system that allowed us to flourish. Granted, we had uh, a couple of good tight ends and Anthony Spasano. But you put together an offensive line. You put together that running game with Ronnie and Ricky. And then Chad Pennington, I mean, you're still rocking the jersey. I love that. This dude is the ultimate leader. And, and always been knocked for his arm strength. But was an amazing quarterback as far as communication he tells you what you want and if you do it he delivers um so it shows you that the, the yes first round receivers you know these true number ones are awesome and, and there's 
there's no replacing that threat. But you can function without that because we technically didn't have anyone who would call a number one receiver, but we had, had a strong offense that that spread it around and then the camaraderie in the group. It was the only time in eight years on an NFL team where we did our own rotation. So it was as if Devon was feeling it, he was going to play more. If I was feeling it, I was going to play more. And the coach just, um, Carl Durrell was our receiver coach, and he just rolled with it. And it, and it was awesome. And it was um, a lot of fun. Put into perspective for me, if you can, how fast Ted gets. Absurdly fast. <laughs> Absurdly fast. So it's uh, Darrell Revis was, is, was the best quarterback that I ever played against. And Ted started social distancing by catching touchdowns six feet in front of him. And, and that's just unreal. Because, I mean, Darrell Revis is a Hall of Fame level cornerback that when, when he was playing against me, it was like, all right, let's just skip that side of the field and go somewhere else. But Ted was able to just put the burners on and, uh, for him to be playing, he's got to be, what, 35 years old right now? He's a free agent, but still has the burners. That's, that, that guy can roll. Is there anybody alive that could beat him in a 40-yard dash race if there's money on the line? Oh, man. Some of these young dudes probably have, probably have it in them, but the Ted in his prime, it, it, it was, that was going to be a tough one to beat. You play basketball, is that right? Uh, recreationally, yeah. Well, you, you, played, you played in school. I mean, you, know, you weren't a you didn't go pro, but you, you were your baller, right? I, I try. I bring the football mentality to the, to the basketball court for what that's worth. Did you play any uh, play off season with any Dolphins? I know there's a lot of guys who claim they, they could who? There are a lot of guys that claim that. And there are actually a lot of guys that can. So the, the, big, I know. the biggest surprise to me was actually Josh McCown, who was another guy that literally just finished playing. Um like so, you know, when a white dude walks in the gym and he's like, "Yeah, I got game," you know, yeah, you know, whatever. But then the dude just walks up to the hoop and just jumps and dunks it. I'm like, "Oh wow!" And Josh McCown has some basketball game, man. And it's he's he's one of you know, as a quarterback, you never really get your athleticism tested all that much in practice. But then when I saw that on a basketball court, man, that guy can hoop. Well, uh, all right. So now that we got you going, and you can kind of maybe pinpoint best shooter. Football player, but on a court, I mean, lights out. Oh, man. So I played in San Diego with Antonio Gates, and we played yeah. a pickup game. And this dude, he, I mean, he was a college basketball player. He beat Duke, he, right? He was next level. And, like, you couldn't – I mean, how could I – I was guarding him. And what is he, weigh 250? He's probably 6'3", six, 6'4", six, and quick, and can shoot, and dribble. And it's just like, I, I had no chance. So he, he embarrassed me on the basketball court. That's a good name there because he, he did, did. Did he play football in college or was he just like a Tony Gonzalez and just played ball? And then? So Tony Gonzalez played both, I believe. Yeah, I, don't okay, I don't remember. I don't remember. Antonio Gates played only basketball. I could be wrong, but I think he played only basketball. And now everyone's a basketball player tied at everybody. It's like, yeah. and oh. Yeah. So talk, talk to me about what you're up to just, you know, overall now, you know, how you kind of keep uh, the football mentality. You know, yeah, with, so uh, you know, I live in San Diego with, with my family, and um, I've got a job at the University of San Diego. So I'm an academic counselor in the athletic department. Um, so that's what I do during the days, during the football season. Uh, I'm an analyst for NBC out here. We do football night in San Diego. It's a recap after Sunday night football. Uh, so that keeps me in and around football. That's my excuse to stay glued to the TV and watch everything, keep up to date on everything. Um, because after Sunday Night Football, i got to go on there and have an opinion about what's going on. So that's my way of staying connected with the sport. Uh, and, and it's working out real well. Because after I finished playing, I went through a, you know, a couple-year period where I didn't want to be around football. I didn't want to watch football because I still felt like I should be out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's an unhealthy break, which a lot of guys go through. But I, broadcasting allowed me to find my way back into the sport. And, um, and we just... We miss football season, man. It's, it's a fun time, and especially now. We could use that draft, but I, I, I really hope that we have a full, um, regular football season. I completely hear you. I mean, obviously, health and everything is, is first and foremost. Sport heals. This is obviously a bigger situation than anything, but I do think that when everything gets okay, and you're someone who is connecting, you know, fans, game, with your broadcasting. So hopefully we do get back to some normalcy. I don't want to forget about asking one question, then I'll let you get on with your Sunday evening. Do you have the ball from the runoff? 
Yeah, man, it's a. Uh, so stay you don't have to get it. I just wanted to know you have it. Yep, it, it's up there. That's it's all right I wanted to make right sure. In the corner, and this, as you can see, I'm in my office. This picture right I here. Saw that. Where yeah, that you're where's my finger? There you That's go. It. That's the runoff there right here. Nice. Yeah, and then this one is actually people ask me, "What was your this, was that your favorite game, or was that your favorite moment?" Um, and so this one, it's hard to see. This. Dang, this is hard watching my finger in the so that is after the Chargers came to San Diego in what must have been 2008 um, and so I got to play against my former team where I never had a catch as a San Diego Chargers they came to Miami I was a starting receiver I had yeah, probably four or five catches and a touchdown um, so to get to shine in front of my my good friends my former teammates and then to come away with a victory. Uh, that was one of the most special times of my career. Last question. You, you, you mentioned, you know, you, you worked your way up to really everything. You know, I kind of, I think I read you, you walked on at Stanford almost, and then you, were you a punter? I was a walk-on receiver slash punter. That's great. Yeah. And like, what would you have to say if there was a receiver sitting at home on April 23rd, 4th, 5th, the draft, and they don't get the call, but they're ready to go outside and hit the weights, hit the whatever. What's your message? Just be ready. There's, you know, be ready for your opportunity. You never know what your opportunity may be. Uh, and, and, you know, if we ever connect again on a future podcast, I've got a whole story as to what led me to have that mentality. But uh, an opportunity will eventually knock. And this goes for any anyone in any walk of life. Make sure you're ready for that opportunity. And when I got a chance to go to San Diego and try out, I got, uh, it was mini camp. I had three days and, and five practices over those three days. Uh, I was ready, and then I put in my work in the playbook. I knew all the plays, um, and I was a backup for several years. And so I learned that when that opportunity comes, you're going to get one shot, and you better be ready for that shot. And that's exactly what happened for that runoff catch. I had one catch for two yards going into that game. And here comes my opportunity, and now uh, I get to celebrate with Dolphin fans to this day because I was ready for that opportunity. So that that's the message. Get prepared, get ready. Here it comes. Fantastic. Many appreciations. Thanks. And just, this is a thrill. Miami Dolphin legend, Minnesota Viking, New Orleans Saint, and just Stanford Cardinal. Awesome. Love it, man. Thank you, Jason. You got it. Thank you, Greg. Happy and happy. And uh, well, definitely, I'm going to take you up on that offer. I'll get you on another cast. All right. Sounds good. Have a good one, man.